Well, good evening again, everybody, and a big welcome back to Darwin Centre Live, and a big welcome to our web viewers as well. So tonight we're going to be talking about evolutionary theory and about its implications for how we live our lives, how we should live our lives, and die our deaths. Uh, in the first half, we're going to be talking mainly about morality and ethics, uh, and a, a little bit about how an evolutionary perspective um, affects our, our cherished concepts in philosophy of mind, like, like free will and consciousness and things like that. Uh, then we're going to have a short break, and in the second half, we're going to be talking about the implications of evolutionary theory for progress, the idea of progress, and our individual and species death. So we'll end on a nice, happy note there. Um, let me introduce my speakers. Professor Richard Dawkins uh, is a zoologist who's held the Charles, Simo Charles Simone Chair of Public Understanding of Science at Oxford University since 1995. Since publishing The Selfish Gene in 1976, he's published wi widely in the field of evolutionary theory and genetics, including The Blind Watchmaker, Climbing Mount Pro Improbable and Unweaving the Rainbow. Since qualifying as a doctor in 1959, Jonathan Miller has co-authored and appeared in Beyond the Fringe, worked as an author, lecturer, television producer and presenter, and directed in theatre, opera and film. His most recent collaborations with the BBC was a documentary series, Jonathan Miller's Brief History of Disbelief, which led viewers on a personal journey uncovering the hidden story of atheism. Dr. Norman MacLeod is Keeper of Paleontology at the Natural History Museum. He's the first U.S. national to be selected Keeper of any NHM science department in its 250-year history. His research interests include historical paleoecology and causes of extinction events. He's the co-author of several books and resources, including the Cretaceous Tertiary Mass Extinction and the Paleobase series of electronic paleontological databases. I'm so pleased with myself for getting that out that I might say it again. Uh, <laughs> So, if I could start with you, Jonathan. Um, your recent series, uh, A Brief History of, of Disbelief, was, was looking at the, the place of atheism in the history of ideas. Um, and I was wondering how you thought Darwin's theory changed what it's like to be an atheist. I think that there were many people for whom... Uh, uh, I think, like Richard, I remember my, uh, the interview we had uh, for the program. There were many people who, in fact... Uh, um, who started their life as Christians, who were affected by reading Darwin, so that, and, that for, for whom it was a sort of road to Damascus um, in reverse. Um, and um, I think that there are a number of people, I don't know how many, and I think that it's very, very hard to do you know, cultural demography on this, but there are, where are a number of people, impossible to count, for whom, in fact, Darwinian theory must have change their minds um, about the notion of intelligent design, about the notion of a disembodied intelligence at the origin of things. Um, but I think I, speaking for myself, and I think I probably represent another very large constituency of people for whom Darwin simply came along. I mean, it was a, a, massive, uh, a massively important biological theory, but had no effect at all on my disbelief. I never had any belief at any time in my life. Um, I came from a Jewish family that had no interest in, uh, in, at the most, they had an interest in the cultural history of Judaism, but no religious belief of any sort at all. Um, my father perhaps was more, uh, he gravitated towards Spinoza, which was a way of being a disbeliever and a respectably Jewish at the same time. Um, my mother was a disbeliever from the start of her life, as indeed I was. And I think there are many, many people. Um, and this is a large constituency of people who never had a religious belief, for whom Darwin merely is yet another confirmation of, uh, of that disbelief. Do you think it's lent it as a certain scientific respectability, lent atheism, that is? Well, it depends who's making the judgments of respectability. There are, of course, religious people for whom the association between atheism and Darwinism is a sign, a further sign, of its fundamental unrespectability. Um, it just confirms the, the, their belief, the religious belief, of what a depraved lot we are to fail to acknowledge the magnificent designing ingenuity of the deity. And uh, I remember lecturing to a group of students in, uh, in Truman State College up in uh, Kirksville, Missouri. And uh, 
I was talking about the history of biology and someone leaned towards me and obviously spoke acting as a spokesman for the rest of the class and said, uh, Dr. Miller, are you, are, you, uh, are you an evolutionist? And I said, well, only in the sense that I'm a gravitationist, you see. Um, <laughs> and then he said, no, but do you, do, you, do, you, do you believe in Darwin? And I said, well, yeah, yes, I, 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 of course I do. I think this, this is a great discovery. Do you, are you a believer in God? And I said, no, you're an atheist. And I said, well, I hate to use the term. because." It, and, and, but he said, but you are an atheist. I said, all right, let's say I'm an atheist. And then he leant towards me in, in a very puzzled way and said, but you're very courteous. <laughs> <laughs> Did you stay courteous for the rest of the No, day? I stayed courteous. I suppose they expected me to be a sort of rapist as I moved across the campus. You know, <laughs> my fangs would appear and all sorts of unspeakable misconducts would emerge uh, from my atheism. Norm MacLeod, um, evolutionary theory has revolutionized biology, but do you think it has as yet a big influence on, on people's lives? I mean, you use it in your work on a, on a, on a daily basis, but for, for most of us, aside from the old tabloid headline, um, do you think it really has a big impact on our lives? I believe it does, but, uh, but the, impact, uh, the impact is so large that it often goes unremarked upon. One of the... Um, uh, what natural selection is, what, uh, well, we, I think we have to distinguish between Darwin's theory of, uh, of, the, um, uh, of common descent or, or his demonstration of common descent. Most of the book is actually about common descent. And then his theory of natural selection, which has changed over, over the years because Darwin didn't know about Mendelism. But in both senses, I think that the, uh, the, the influence is so pervasive that, uh, that we often don't, uh, don't acknowledge it whatsoever. For example, the idea of selection. We use selection in our, in our normal lives. The idea that uh, a, uh, a product or a person or, a, uh, or an idea appeals to us, then we gravitate toward it and we, gra and we select it. We select things almost every, every second that we're conscious. We, we, do, a, we do selection. And this is, Darwin teased out how important that was, especially when we, uh, when we compare the power of selection uh, operating over vast, the vast scale of geologic time and how it can actually transform, be a creative force. Richard Dawkins, do you think it's affected our lives in a moral sense, the way we live our moral lives? No, not really. Um, nor, I think, probably should it in any naive and simple sense. Uh, I certainly don't think we ought to be getting our morals from Darwinism in a kind of um, parable or allegorical sense. The social Darwinists kind of did that. And uh, around the turn of the 19th, 20th century, they tried to inject a kind of poetic Darwinism into human affairs and morality. And uh, it, it was a kind of mad Thatcherism. It was sort of the, the weakest to the wall and the strongest shall win and this is the Darwinian way and therefore um, it's, it's, it's right because it is the way of nature, that, that kind of thing. Well, we've thankfully thrown that overboard. M my own view is that if you're going to get any kind of ethical principle from Darwinism, it should almost be with a negative sign. You could almost define the kind of society we don't want to live in as a Darwinian society. So I've always said that I'm a passionate Darwinian when it comes to understanding why we're here. And I'm a passionate anti-Darwinian when it comes to um, the kind of society we ought to be living in and our morality and how we ought to treat each other. Of course, Darwinians can try to understand where our moral and ethical feelings come from. We can ask questions like, why are we so nice? which is a pretty baffling question in a, to a naive Darwinian. Why do we give money to charity? Why do we give blood? Um, why do we feel this enormous pang of compassion when we see a, a crying child or a, or a, or a starving person or, a, or indeed a, a starving animal of another species or a, 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 a creature in, in pain? Has it made any in, inroads into that? Well, it... it, it it leaves us a bit baffled, and, and uh, we, we can understand it, but, it, but it's not a, not a simple thing to understand. But I think the, the greatest inroad that Darwinism or evolution generally ought to have on our moral sense is that it might lead us to, to think we're on our own in the universe, 
And it's up to us to decide how we're going to run our lives, how we're going to run our society. Um, we've got to make our own ethics because we're not going to get any help from elsewhere. There is no higher power that's going to tell us what's right and wrong. So what's right and wrong is something that we've got to come up with by discussion, by lawmaking, by um, uh, legal precedent, by moral philosophy, um, all those sorts of things. Um, we don't get it from outside and that, that to me is what ought to be the big impact of Darwinism. In The Selfish Gene, you argued that we are survival machines that were built by our genes for their own reproductive purposes. That's often been miscast as an argument that we are intrinsically selfish. Why is that interpretation wrong? Well, um, f first of all, why is that interpretation made? It's, it's made by people who've read the book by title only, mm. um, which is a, 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 a fairly fashionable way of, of reading a book. <laughs> Um, uh, the, the, the selfish gene is not, of course, about why we're selfish. It's actually largely about why we're not selfish, um, given that our genes are in the special sense in which, in which genes are. That special sense is just that the level at which, the level in the hierarchy of life at which natural selection acts is fruitfully seen as the gene in the sense of the population geneticist allele. So, um, you, you have to ask the question, in a neo-Darwinian population, what is it that actually changes in frequency as natural selection goes on? As the generations go by, certain genes become more frequent in the population, other genes become less frequent in the population. That statistical process is natural selection. The phenotypic manifestations of that statistical process are what we observe. you say phenotypic? Um, the, the observable bodily effects of those genes are what we see as whole organism biologists or as ordinary people who, who look at animals evolving. Um, but fundamentally what's going on in natural selection is that certain genes are becoming more frequent in the population, in the gene pool, others are becoming less frequent. And so those genes that look after themselves by causing bodies to take action to save those genes, look after those genes and to hell with all the others, um, those are the ones which um, will survive. And so what we see are bodies, what we see are animals and plants built by genes which are good at looking after themselves. Um, it's that, that is the sense of selfish gene. It doesn't mean in any way that we, that we should predict that organisms will always be selfish. They could be altruistic in the protection of their selfish genes. And also it, it, it got the idea spread. I mean people misinterpreted the notion of the selfish gene. Um, A to uh, uh, to somehow underwrite their own belief that we were selfish, but also I think probably they misinterpreted the idea of the selfish gene as if in fact these particles were in fact had a little homunculus inside oh, yeah. us, which mm. was in fact selfishly pursuing its own interests, yes. whereas what we're talking about is simply a chemical process yes. um, which has neither interests uh, nor in fact intentions. And I think probably that the notion of the selfish gene from they extract from the title gives the notion of the gene as a microscopically intentional entity which pursues its interests in some way because it's intentional. And of course, I think the great thing about Darwinism, um, I don't know how widespread the influence of this aspect of Darwinism is, is that it has removed intention from nature. Um, I think for those of us who in fact are disbelievers, one of the great reliefs is actually to realize that intention itself comes into the universe only with organisms. It isn't the cause of organisms. And mm -hmm. what I think is interesting about religious people is that they put the cart before the horse. They actually think that intention brought the universe into existence and don't understand that intention is actually a late arrival in the universe and only occurs when you get biological organisms that do pursue interests. Nevertheless, um, Norm MacLeod, um, e e even, even though that may be the case, might knowing that, that we are built by genes change the way we behave. Um, my, for all my individual, ind individuality, if I believe that I'm basically a glorified machine for reproducing a bit of ancient code, um, well, not very glorified, but a machine, <laughs> and, and that so is everyone else, 
is that not liable to change my behaviour, to, to influence me perhaps towards selfishness, or at least to change my moral behaviour? I, I, I don't think it will. Um, uh, and I think that there's, there's lots of evidence to indicate that it won't. There, there are, are a number of different social systems. What we're talking about is so, behaviour is part of a social system. There are a number of different social systems that, uh, that exist in the world, and various different beliefs as to what is right and what is wrong. There are, there are differences between all of them, but also there are strong similarities. We, we know how to live in a society. We, we've done it for millions of years, uh, literally, and uh, we know the basic rules. We've selected those basic rules according to Darwinian principles because they help us survive. That we're survival machines. I certainly agree with that. Um, the, uh, the idea that we are mindless, uh, autom uh, mindless uh, robots uh, and that we can get by within the context of our society by just being selfish or just doing whatever, whatever strikes our fancy at the, at, the, uh, at the moment, those would be actively selected against and they have been selected against. We are the products of getting along, of, of ancestors who learned how to get along in society. The ones that didn't learn how to get along in society were selected out long ago. It doesn't mean we're perfect. It doesn't, doesn't mean we don't make mistakes. We do. We're not perfect machines. But that in itself is an aspect that, uh, that uh, shows that we have free will, that we do have this consciousness that allows us to make the decisions. But also, I don't think the genes, it's, it's very interesting the way in which genes are sort of bear the weight of anxiety yes. now. Yeah, um, they're abstract. I mean, you know, well, but the, but the fact is that um, why is it not disturbing to our sense of our own humanity to discover that, in fact, that, the, that our actions and our thoughts are mediated and implemented by things to which we have no access at all, um, like you know, digital nerve impulses? Yeah. Um, I know perfectly well, because I've been taught it, that what makes me actually, what allows me to reach for that glass is a traffic of all or none impulses traveling towards the various muscles which implement the extension of my arm and the flexion of my fingers. But I somehow, in the knowledge that I am, after all, um, active by virtue of nerve impulses, I don't feel less human. So I don't think that genes are any more villainous than nerve impulses are in that respect. I mean, what we have discovered is the basis of our physical being. But we know perfectly well from the, our consciousness that we're not just deluded about free will. That's what our free will is made of. Yes. Yes. Do you think evolution has anything to say about free will? Uh, it's one of those, one of those big... Uh, concepts in, in philosophy of mind um, that, that has, has caused a lot of problems uh, as people try to come to grips with it from an evolutionary point of view because evolution is a, is a gradualist theory and a, and a gradual a process. Um, the argument goes that you can either have free will or you can't. You can either have consciousness or you can't. Richard Dawkins, do you think evolution has anything to say about these grand mysteries? No, I think um, Jonathan's just answered that. Um, I, th I think that whatever you think about free will, you're going to go on thinking about free will after you've learned about evolution, probably. I mean, there, there, might, there might be slight exceptions to that. An evolutionist might ask, for example, if there is free, free will, then... At what point in evolutionary history did it, did it enter nervous systems or something of that sort? But I, I think that could end up being philosophically awfully confused. I think the whole debate is pretty confused anyway, in fact, and I doubt if bringing in, certainly bringing in genes isn't going to help. Yeah. Jonathan's totally I mean, right about that. I mean, I think you could do a thought experiment. Let's say that we never um, stumbled across, or that Darwin never formulated, a theory of um, origins and, um, and you know, a descent with modification and that we didn't know, didn't know anything about descent, but knew an enormous amount about nervous systems. That without knowing how they we evolved, that we discovered, as we have done in the last hundred years, with the discoveries of Adrian and Bronk and so forth, that you know the frequency intensity law and all the stuff which we know about nervous traffic, would we think of ourselves as less human by virtue of knowing that we are as mechanical as we turn out to be, look, without any Darwinian theory at all? Would that make us anxious? Um, no, because we, we get up in the morning and decide to have breakfast. And we don't have to say, oh God, I had my breakfast by virtue of something that happened in my brain over which I had no control. Um, I'd better go back to bed again and rethink my breakfast. Um, <laughs> I don't think anyone gets anxious about having a nervous system, and I don't think we should be any more anxious about having genes than we are about having uh, 
uh, having action potentials. But uh, nevertheless, we're, we're, um, without a kind of mechanistic explanation for, for the origin of, of, of humanity, of, of humans, and the life of the mind, you could always claim that something was, was activating all those neural pathways, something was making all that mechanics happen that was insubstantial, that was not material. It becomes harder to do when you've got an explanatory theory. No, because we become even more robotic then. If, in fact, you don't have a, um, an evolutionary theory and you still maintain a religious theory in the knowledge that you are, in fact, uh, um, um, a traffic of nerve impulses, then you would say that we're nothing more than puppets. One theory says we're robots, but if you, in fact, retain God and retain the idea of action potentials, you simply say action potentials are the strings by which God actually determines our actions. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that you're fucked both ways, you see. <laughs> I mean, but most religious leaders would, would acknowledge the, the existence of free will. They, they, they don't view God, whatever it, whatever it might be, if it exists, which I, don't, which I don't think, but they don't view it as a puppet. People have, even the, relig even the great religions would argue that, they, uh, that free will exists. Well, in that case, what I've never understood, and I don't know what Richard thinks about this, is, is what they think free will. Is it a sort of um, um, a capricious event that intervenes between something which is deterministic most of the time, and then every now and then there's a sort of sabbatical um, interlude of, uh, of uh, voluntariness? And what would that be? Um, would it suddenly mean that we suspend action potentials for a while, and actually get into the act spiritually without action potentials. I just don't see no, what the argument is. I suppose is. it could be something like a, 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 a quantum indeterminate event or something like <laughs> that sort. I don't well, in that case, it makes God into so a... It's nothing to do with God. No, and it makes, but, if, yeah. if that were God, then yeah. God himself is um, a, simply a victim of his own uncontrollable caprice. Yes. I think they cover themselves by, uh, by referring to the mystery of faith. Oh, mystery is a great, a great get out. Yes, yes. <laughs> mystery will do nice. Or the leap of faith, you see, which always seems to be. To, well, why isn't it regarded as a stumble? <laughs> there's a, there's a, also a feeling that that if these uh, these qualities, like free will, like consciousness, are are mechanistic, that they're somehow not real. They're not the real thing. They're a, they're a close approximation. Um, do do we do we want to solve the, this issue? I mean, if, if consciousness and free will are, are revealed as the activity of the brain's neurochemistry, are they, are they um, then no longer real? Have we kind of murdered them to dissect? Mm -hmm. Anybody? <laughs> Please. Uh, I, think the, uh, I think we tend to anthropomorphize uh, everything. We, we, we view everything from our, from our own experience, which of course is within the context of a, of a conscious being that... Uh, that has free will and that is uh, is self actuating the idea that uh, that i think I think there 's a certain cognitive dissonance with the, uh, for many people with the idea that uh, that uh, something that is uh, essentially uh, a physical process uh, physical electronic process uh, can through through complex interactions can actually combine to create a free will, a free choice, a free, uh, a, a, uh, an ability to chart one's own course. Uh, it's a little bit, from the physical realm, it's, it seems a little bit like uh, the, it's always seemed to me a little bit like the electron, which is uh, at once uh, a wave and a particle. It doesn't, doesn't quite seem to make sense, but nevertheless, it's true. Yes, but you see, I think that that indeterminacy principle, which was one which was invoked by, uh, by John Eccles when he, he, he wrote The Neurophysiological Basis of Mind, which has been a, was a, which is a perfectly orthodox piece of neurology until the last ten paragraphs of the book. And he uses indeterminacy as a sort of a foot in the door for free will, that right down at the level of the uh, synaptic junction mm. between nerve endings and muscles, because, in fact, it's, these things are so small, that's where indeterminacy gets into the act. That's where God and, and that and, and that's where free will gets in. Uh -huh. The free will gets in by making up its mind at the place where the, where the molecules um, are undetermined. Mm. And that seems a, very, a rather ghastly form of free will, because it just makes it seem like a sort of curious electronic accident. And therefore it cancels the idea of free will rather than enhancing it. Mm.
think Denny refers to it as a variety of free will that's not really worth wanting. That's right. I mean, the forms of free will worth wanting, which mm. he talks about in Elbow Room, um, it, it, I mean, we all know we've got it, and we all know that there are limitations upon it. We, we all know that we can't jump ten feet, that we can jump three, and that uh, with difficulty, um, and, 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 and as, you know, get as old as I am, about 18 inches. Um, but nevertheless, I don't feel that my free will is curtailed by the limitations upon my apparatus. But I also get up in the morning and decide what I want to do. And I don't think something's deciding for me. Moving away from free will, back, back to uh, morality. Um, in, in some religions, in many religions, the, the kind of engine of morality is, is reward and punishment. If there is nobody watching, if there's, if there's no eternal bliss or damnation to follow, then what's the incentive to act morally? Jonathan. Getting on nice, nicely. <laughs> it's just nicer, on the whole, to behave nicely. Um, people, people behave nicer to you if you behave nicer to them. Life becomes convivial. I mean, in that true, you know, linguistic sense of convivial. Living together. Living together turns out to be an amiable and pleasant way of, uh, of carrying on your life. Every now and then there are these catastrophic suspensions of conviviality, which we've seen as that lovely book by Samantha Power, you know, on a problem from hell, we seem to have the capacity not only for being nice, but we have a capacity for being nastier than anything else on earth. One of the things I was struck by when the tsunami happened and people were talking about the you know, 200,000 people killed as a result of these tectonic plates, within the same 10 days that we were actually commemorating um, Auschwitz. Now, in between 1900 and 2000, we, all of us, have killed no less than 250 million of each other. And it seems to me that tectonic plates are very minor events in our lives, that we are nastier than anything else on Earth, as well as being nicer than anything else on Earth. And I don't think that actually the Darwinian theory is a help one way or the other. It just turns out to be the way we are in in a way that we cannot fully explain. There is something, to go back to, to the, your question, there's something rather contemptible, I fully agree with everything Jonathan said, by the way, something rather contemptible about the idea that you're only moral because of reward and punishment. I mean, the, th the thought that people would suddenly stop being moral if, if they didn't believe there was a great head prefect in the sky, I mean, a, a, sky, a spy camera looking at their every move and indeed spying even on their every thought. Um, if people are not moral without that, then it's not really very moral at all um, that, that they are. Those of us who manage to be moral without being spied upon in our imagination um, are surely much more deeply moral than those who need the discipline of being spied upon by a, uh, by a um, divine, uh, well, as I said, head prefect. Well, I mean, it's, it's interesting that, that long before Darwin, the Adam Smith, who is so conspicuously ignored by Mrs. Thatcher, um, she invokes one book um, and completely neglects the other, which I think is much more important, which is the theory of the moral sentiments that actually, long before Darwin, he identified this curiously human capacity that we have to, to sympathize, to feel for others' distress, to be um, in pain when others are in pain, and to move towards others helpfully. Um, now this is something, you know, which Mrs. Thatcher, who said there's no such thing as society, the one thing that Adam Smith actually indicated was that society actually has as its cement long before there was any Darwinian theory to account for it, a curious capacity peculiar to us, though we begin to see it in the later, in the, in the more, um, sorry, uh, more evolved primates, a sense of actually knowing that others suffer. Um, what the people who are now working on autism understand, we have a theory of other, of other minds. Hmm. People like Simon Baron Cohen, for example, in his great book, Mind Blindness, was one of the people who identified that what goes on with autism is a failure to recognize that these pink things moving in our circumference of vision are in fact moved by the same sorts of desires, pains, anxieties, fears, and fulfillments as we ourselves are.
And that's what Adam Smith identified. And it is what society is made of. Um, and that's what makes us moral. But it also doesn't explain, in the end, and this may be a Darwinian, uh, uh, it, it requires a Darwinian explanation, why also we can, as they did in Rwanda, kill 700,000 of one another without any firearms in the course of six weeks. And of course also, ideas of morality do vary very widely across cultures. Something else has come out in, in events of the last few years. Uh, the being nice to each other in one place can be very different from being nice to each other in another. Yes, I think that's true. I mean, this is where anthropology actually helps us to, to see how various we are. But there are common currents that we share, I think. I think. Being, being nice, I think, it's, I think there's a common uh, sentiment to be, be nice to each other if you're part of the in-group. I think the, the difference between cultures is how bad you can be to people outside of your group. Yes. What about the idea of changing society? If evolutionary theory, as it often does, invokes a, a sense of um, human nature, does that set limits uh, on what we can do with our societies, what we can make people do within them? And are we happy with those limits, Richard? I think that's a rather an open question, um, one that we ought to be working on. Um, there are those people who feel that he human nature is, is, is a very slight part of us and we're almost infinitely malleable and can be changed by education and by social engineering and things. There are others who feel that um, we are at bottom fairly rigid and, and you can only make um, superficial adjustments. Um, and this is one of those controversies that seesaws back and forth over the decades uh, in a, in a, from a historical point of view, rather interesting way. Um, and you can hear fierce arguments which are often much more based on what people would like to be true than what they know to be true. Uh, and um, I, I feel rather open-minded about this particular topic. I mean, you occasionally do get, I mean, disastrous occasions. It makes it sound as if it's rather trivial to use the word occasion, but um, s s social groups such as the Nazis, for whom, in fact, not only were they prompted by, you know, social Darwinism in the crude sense of, uh, you know, competition is all that works, much more sinister was the idea that you can actually um, as, a, as, a, as the Nazis thought, improve society by eliminating what you thought were fallible gene streams. Mm -hmm. um, let's, um, let's gas the, the ones that we don't think are um, living up to it. I'm not just thinking of ethnic groups, but the large numbers of people who were killed in the gas chambers in hospitals um, until about 1941, until the church objected. And it was interesting, it was the church that objected to it that actually stopped the um, the eugenic gassings that went on in the, uh, in the early years of the war. But there was the idea that you could engineer, you could actually eliminate the faulty genes, let's get rid of that lot, they mustn't breed. Um, and actually the Nazis were not the only ones who uh, fell victim to that uh, curious uh, mm. delusion. Um, the Swedes are now admitting that they were doing it as well in the 30s. They were, they were sterilizing people in the belief that they could stop off and have a little sort of ligature on the stream of genes which they judged to be faulty in order to guarantee a healthy stream of the genes they thought to be excellent. Mm. Actually, both of, those, uh, both of those lines of argument, the nature-nurture and the eugenics, trace back to the same person, Francis Galton, yes. who came up, mm. came up with both, both concepts uh, that, uh, that have been, uh, of course, in the case of eugenics, uh, have a long and uh, not very illustrious history. But, the, but they keep recurring. They keep, these they sorts do. of things keep recurring. And also they had occurred before Francis Galton without the, without the pseudoscience that Galton invoked in order to justify it. Um, there was, I mean, amongst the Germans for years, for hundred, hundreds of years, there was an idea that this was in the blood. I mean, the, the metaphor of blood, which really is another way of talking about genes, um, um, was, was there two or three hundred years earlier, if not more. I mean, the, the Germans invoke, I mean, Heidegger, that sort of monstrously obscure and silly man who used to sit in darkened forests in the north of Germany, invoking the idea of Blut und Erde, blood and earth. We are the Germans who come genetically from this part of the land, and we are excellent genetically. Long before anyone had thought of genes, no one knowing about Mendel, they actually invoked blood. Well, blood is a sort of metaphoric antecedent of gene theory. Yes. 
But if, uh, as Norm says, these ideas keep recurring, is there a sense in which uh, Darwinism is a dangerous idea? And that is there, would there, in principle, be any point at which one decided it was so dangerous that the cause of, of, um, of safety was greater than the cause of truth? Well, Dar Darwinism is a dangerous idea in many different respects, but, uh, but any idea taken to an extreme it turns a, can, can be turned into a dangerous idea. But you raise a sort of general question about whether truth should ever be sacrificed for, mm. for uh, political reasons, and, and that's a separate... I mean, I'm quite sure Darwinism never should. I mean, Dar mm -hmm. Darwinism is much too important a truth to, to, for one to mess around with politics if, it's, if, if, if Darwinism had exceedingly undesirable consequences. We'd still have to, have to teach it and learn about it because it's, it's true in a true. massively important way. I mean, one, I think I could imagine that, that, that there might be certain kinds of scientific research which a scientist might defend as being um, purely disinterested um, research, trying to find, find out the, the truth, but society might say, no, this is too dangerous, we don't want you to do it, we'd rather you spend your time doing something else. But it's not going to be something really big like Darwinism. No, Lisa, I think most of the monstrous outrages committed by human beings was, were, were, were committed without scientific justifications. They might have, as it were, alluded to a scientific justification. The real, people the did really do social Darwinism. But people committed the monstrous acts of massacre and genocide um, and might have, as it were, en route, uh, gave it a cosmetic covering of science, but it would have happened even if they had not been able to discover this, that, or the other cosmetic scientific justification, because we have this as yet very difficult to explain um, theme within us, which I suspect we might inherit from our primate uh, antecedents, but it's a... to behave monstrously to things to individuals we believe to be ethnically different from ourselves. It's, but it's a, is, isn't that simply the, the dark side of free will? We are able to do these things because we are free to do them. We are free to do just about anything yes, physically, but, within our physical capability. But I think that begs the question. The, the, the deep question is what, why does this recur? Why is it that the history of human beings, in addition mm. to being a history of enormous cultural um, complexity, beauty, inventiveness, ingenuity, and moral sophistication, which it undoubtedly is. I mean, the sophistication of, the, of morals, often under the auspices of religion, mm -hmm. um, are absolutely paralleled by monstrosity. Mm -hmm. I think at this point, let's see if we can uh, take some questions. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. Uh, yeah, I heard you talk about eugenics and, like, Nowadays, you get these, this uh, thing, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, where you, like, they screen diseases such as like, cystic fibrosis and... Sure. And, and uh, would you say this is, like, well, similar in to the eugenics? I, do you think it's right that... Sorry, um, do you think it's right that we're moving to eliminating the people who have the disease rather than the disease itself? We're not treating the patients, but we're preventing the patients being born. Well, I, it, my answer would be unequivocally yes, it's the right thing to do. Mm. Okay. You see, I think the people who, as it were, are the, the, the supporters of life, um, the, these Christian life supporters, are curiously interested in embryos and curiously indifferent to living human beings. Exactly. As if somehow e embryos are sort of sublimely innocent creatures. Um, and which, which have a sort of a greater right to protection than, than individuals that we recognize and have relationships to. Embryos can, can't disagree with yeah, them. Yeah, that's right. But also, you see, you get someone like George Bush and the Texans, for example, for whom, in fact, they are passionate supporters of the sanctity of life, and they're perfectly prepared to execute very large numbers of people, regardless of their guilt or innocence. With great enjoyment. With great enjoyment. <laughs> So another question from over here. Thank you. Um, two, two points. Uh, you've um, collectively referred uh, obliquely to cultural relativity of uh, moral morality. Um, I'd like to put it to you that, in fact, um, that's a very superficial uh, relativity and that uh, deeper underlying it uh, is a, an almost universal agreement um, about what are good, good moral principles. Um, and it's the, it's the um, variation of 
um, actual circumstances that lead in different societies to different interpretations of those basic principles. I think it was striking that when the national curriculum was being drawn up, the Department for Education invited representatives of a very wide range of religions and non-religious beliefs um, to get together to try to draw up a statement of values, and they found very little difficulty in doing that at all. They t totally disagree about why these things were the right values, but they, they agreed very easily on what they were. And second, just very briefly, um, uh, the, the question of, uh, of evil or, or bad behavior and turning on each other. And it, it's plausible, it seems to me, um, that at least in part, in large part, I think, um, when, we become, when we became as a race self-conscious about uh, our behavior and began to, to conceptualize what was good, what was right, um, it was all too easy to conceptualize it in a way that was fairly crude. Um, and uh, which uh, was expressed in doctrines and dogmas, which could then very easily lead us astray. And I think that a lot of what um, is done that is to, which we would regard as wrong and evil is actually a sort of perverted idealism. Uh, just to anyone in particular, whoever likes to take it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm interested in the, in the question of, of the relativism of... of um, morality in different cultures, and you could very well be right. I mean, I, I would like to learn more about different people's attitudes to morality. Um, whereas anthropologists will tell us that uh, people's peoples differ enormously in the kind of headdresses they wear and the kind of dances they do and things, um, you're saying that that doesn't apply to moral principles. Everybody agrees that you mustn't kill. However, do they agree that you mustn't kill humans, or only that you mustn't kill our tribe ra rather than any, any other tribe? I mean, Old Testament mor morality is all about you mustn't kill Jews, but you can kill anybody else with, mm. with, 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 mm -hmm. with great gusto. Um, and <laughs> other, other religions do the same thing. So I suppose that, that merely turns into another of these universals. Uh, um, The golden rule is universal from the Jains about uh, 600 BC. It is, but what, I, think, through. I think what we lack to some extent coming at it from a, from a comparative point of view, we, we lack the, the, compar the comparator. We are the product of societies that actually have survived. What we actually need are some examples from societies that didn't survive and what their uh, philosophy and what their morality looked like and uh, see if we can explain their demise and our survival on that basis, and, and which is a very interesting anthropological question. I agree with Richard that uh, certainly more work needs to be needs to be done on that. I'm sure experiments. Uh, I'm sure there were societies in the past that were fundamental that were formulated on different principles that uh, that actually didn't work out quite so well. I mean, oh, sorry. sorry no. um, how, how do you feel about the different reproductive rates amongst different strata of? social society or ethnic groups affecting future societies? You mean different, uh, by different groups, you mean different socio-political groups, different ethnic groups, different, both. just anything? But both. I mean that different social class groups and different ethnic groups have different mm -hmm. reproductive rates which will alter the makeup of society in the future. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's difficult I haven't got any problem with it, actually. <laughs> the, uh, the, the, this is a continuing process. The, uh, the, uh, throughout human history, there have been differences in, in reproductive rates, and that's one of the ways that societies turn over, societies churn. I mean, one of the great fantasies of the 19th century, I mean, Galton was a, a great exponent of this, and it, it came from sort of upper middle class, grand people with accents like that, talking about people down in the East End of London who bred like rabbits. <laughs> um, as opposed to um, bread rabbits. It, 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 enormous, enormous upper class families who also bred like rabbits, but they, um, they were pedigree rabbits. That was the... Yes. <laughs> Surely the social structure we have at the moment is just evolutionary, just like any, one, any other uh, process. And the one we have is the one that allows us to work the way we do. And that previously other systems were tried out and just didn't succeed. And we can see that with previous things. For instance, referring back to Nazi Germany, you had the process of it falling to pieces because you had these overstresses which tried to exterminate large sections of its population. So 
Does that mean that, in fact, there is no right, that there is no evil, there's no good, it's just what we determine socially with our narrow social structure? Hmm. I mean, I just don't think there is such a thing as evil, and I don't think there's such a thing as virtue. I mean, I think that evil, which is constantly invoked to explain these outrageous and horrible things that occur to us, I'll make, it, make it look as if there's some sort of deep Brent crude that lies at the basis of human nature, which, which when drilled and hit through, this sort of primeval, pure substance called evil gets things going destructively. And I think it's not like that. What it is is that um, we have a tendency to behave atrociously and we have a tendency to behave in ways which we all think is nicer to live by. But I don't think that virtue and evil are principles in a way that gravity might be or in a way that uh, other natural forces could be. It, it, it isn't a force in nature which, if, um, we, are un which we are unfortunate enough uh, suddenly gushes forth. I don't think there is such a thing as evil. It's what we call certain forms of conduct which we broadly agree are, is not nice. I think, I think it's bound up with the idea of justice. Many people wish to, to see wrongs righted. That, that, that's part of the altruism, part of our, I think, our cultural uh, evolutionary heritage. And, uh, and I think peop the desire to see justice, the desire to see right done is, is so strong that uh, people have erected this mythology about it, that there are certain abstract principles of good and evil. There's a whole mythology that's built around it, but, uh, but I agree with Jonathan that uh, these, are, these are just the ways in which we as animals, as social animals, uh, have come together in the structures that allow our survival, that promote our, our flourishing. I think we've got time for one more question before we break. It, it has long seemed to me that um, religion is, is more um, evil, to, to use the term that's just been used, than has been seriously suggested now, because it makes out uh, that morality in the broad sense, and which as one of the speakers has said is almost universal, but is dependent on pleasing God and gives, gives us all the excuse, well, I don't think there is a God, so why should I be moral? Um, what we should be doing is, is um, preaching the new morality, which, it, which is that for our own survival, we've got to come up with our own concepts of what are good and evil and try and get that established. If I can just jump in here. As an atheist, I feel embarrassed to, to invoke this, but I always think of myself as what I call a pious atheist. And I do believe that one of the things that one has to, as it were, grant religion, or grant religion as a, as a developmental theme and motif in human history, is that it has been one of the channels through which poetic and extremely uh, powerful metaphors of belonging to one another have been expressed. Um, I think that, for example, someone like uh, Jesus Christ, I mean, it's, religious people would say, what do you mean someone like Jesus Christ? I mean, but anyway, <laughs> Jesus Christ invoked these principles, which we all adhere to, and the, the, the notion of charity, of, of, of valuing the, the poor and the underprivileged, and of the meek, and, of, and, and you know, all the people who are mentioned in the Sermon on the Mount, that it only actually came into the imagination of someone like Jesus, as it does into the, some of the most extraordinarily poetic and powerful images that have come up, under the auspices of the idea that we owe to each other these various <coughs> values precisely because we are the children of God. Now, I think, that, I think that's not true, but it, it is an undeniably poetic metaphor which has actually animated some of the most important moral developments in human history. I wonder whether that's a kind of historical accident, that, that through, through most of history, everybody literally has been religious and everybody has thought in religious terms. It's rather like the same thing what one says that, that religion is responsible for so much great art and great music. Well, one almost say, of, of course, because they were the people who had the money to patronize it. Similarly, um, 
a great teacher like Jesus, um, it, may, it may be almost incidental that he happened to work within a religious framework. He, he worked in a religious framework because within his time you could not do anything else. You, you were well, actually, I, I, wish I, I wish I could think that. I mean, as, a, as, a, as an energetic atheist as well as a pious one, <laughs> I, I actually do feel that there is something about the poetic power of the imagery and the transcendentalism, the very fact, that the very thing that we find objectionable, the transcendentalism of religion has been the source of some of its most powerful moral ideas. The idea that we are, in fact, holders of a thing called a spirit. I don't think we are, but as a poetic metaphor, it has actually empowered an enormous amount of moral activity. Well, I should like to look at uh, post-religious teachers of ethics. Gandhi called himself religious, but he, his religion didn't really inform his, his moral philosophy. Um, Bertrand Russell, um, moral philosophers today who think deeply about why we should be good from a non-religious point of view. Um, I'm not sure there's all that much difference. I, 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 I'm not sure that it, it isn't an incidental thing. I'm afraid we're going to have to yeah. leave it there for the moment because we're going to take a break. Everyone go and have a glass of wine and have a chat. Uh, we haven't got any spirit real or otherwise, or I suppose it's only non-existent <laughs> stuff. But uh, there's wine and water and orange juice, uh, and we'll start again in about 15 minutes. more uh, he gravitated towards Spinoza which was a way of being a disbeliever and a respectably Jewish at the same time um, my mother was a disbeliever from the start of her life as indeed I was and I think there are many many people um, and this is a large constituency of people who never had a religious belief for whom Darwin merely is yet another confirmation of uh, of that disbelief do you think it's lent it as a certain scientific respectability, lent atheism, that's it? Well, it depends who's making the judgments of respectability. There are, of course, religious people for whom the association between atheism and Darwinism is a sign, a further sign, of its fundamental unrespectability. Um, it just confirms the, the, their belief, the religious belief, of what a depraved lot we are to fail to acknowledge the magnificent designing ingenuity of the deity. And uh, I remember lecturing to a group of students in, uh, in Truman State College up in uh, Kirksville, Missouri, and uh, I was talking about the history of biology, and someone leaned towards me, and obviously spoke, acting as a spokesman for the rest of the class, and said, uh, Dr. Miller, are you, are, you, uh, are you an evolutionist? And I said, well, only in the sense that I'm a gravitationist, you see. Um, <laughs> and then they said, no, but do you, do, you, do, you, do you believe in Darwin? And I said, well, yeah, yes, I, 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 of course I do. I think this, this is a great discovery. Do you, are you a believer in God? And I said, no, you're an atheist. And I said, well, I hate to use the term. Because it, and, and, but he said, but you are an atheist. I said, all right, let's say I'm an atheist. And then he leaned towards me in, in a very puzzled way and said, but you're very courteous. <laughs> <laughs> Did you stay courteous for the rest of the No, time? I stayed courteous. I suppose they expected me to be a sort of rapist as I moved across the campus. You know, <laughs> my fangs would appear and all sorts of unspeakable misconducts would emerge uh, from my atheism. Norm MacLeod, um, evolutionary theory has revolutionized biology, but do you think it has as yet a big influence on, on people's lives? I mean, you use it in your work on a, on a, on a daily basis, but for, for most of us, aside from the old tabloid headline, um, do you think it really has a big impact on our lives? I believe it does, but, uh, but the, impact, uh, the impact is so large that it often goes unremarked upon. One of the... Um, uh, what natural selection is, what, uh, well, we, I think we have to distinguish between Darwin's theory of, uh, of, the, um, uh, of common descent or, or his demonstration of common descent. Most of the book is actually about common descent. And then his theory of natural selection, which has changed over, over the years because Darwin didn't know about Mendelism. 
But in both senses, I think that the, uh, the, the influence is so pervasive that, uh, that we often don't, uh, don't acknowledge it whatsoever. For example, the idea of selection. We use selection in our, in our normal lives. The idea that uh, a, uh, a product or a person or, a, uh, or an idea appeals to us, then we gravitate toward it and we, gra and we select it. We select things almost every, every second that we're conscious. We, we, do a, we do selection. And this is, Darwin teased out how important that was, especially when we, uh, when we compare the power of selection operating over vast, the vast scale of geologic time and how it can actually transform, be a creative force. Richard Dawkins, do you think it's affected our lives in a moral sense, the way we live our moral lives? No, not really. Um, nor, I think, probably should it in any naive way and simple sense. Uh, I certainly don't think we ought to be getting our morals from Darwinism in a kind of um, parable or allegorical sense. The social Darwinists kind of did that. And uh, around the turn of Well, good evening again, everybody, and a big welcome back to Darwin Centre Live, and a big welcome to our web viewers as well. So tonight we're going to be talking about evolutionary theory and about its implications for how we live our lives, how we should live our lives, and die our deaths. Uh, in the first half, we're going to be talking mainly about morality and ethics, uh, and a, a little bit about how an evolutionary perspective um, affects our, our cherished concepts in philosophy of mind, like, like free will and consciousness and things like that. Uh, then we're going to have a short break, and in the second half, we're going to be talking about the implications of evolutionary theory for progress, the idea of progress, and our individual and species death. So we'll end on a nice, happy note there. Um, let me introduce my speakers. Professor Richard Dawkins uh, is a zoologist who's held the Charles, Simo Charles Simone Chair of Public Understanding of Science at Oxford University since 1995. Since publishing The Selfish Gene in 1976, he's published wi widely in the field of evolutionary theory and genetics, including The Blind Watchmaker, Climbing Mount Pro Improbable and Unweaving the Rainbow. Since qualifying as a doctor in 1959, Jonathan Miller has co-authored and appeared in Beyond the Fringe, worked as an author, lecturer, television producer and presenter, and directed in theatre, opera and film. His most recent collaborations with the BBC was a documentary series, Jonathan Miller's Brief History of Disbelief, which led viewers on a personal journey uncovering the hidden story of atheism. Dr. Norman MacLeod is Keeper of Paleontology at the Natural History Museum. He's the first U.S. national to be selected Keeper of any NHM science department in its 250-year history. His research interests include historical paleoecology and causes of extinction events. He's the co-author of several books and resources, including the Cretaceous Tertiary Mass Extinction and the Paleobase series of electronic paleontological databases. I'm so pleased with myself for getting that out that I might say it again. Uh, so... If I could start with you, Jonathan, um, your recent series, uh, A Brief History of, of Disbelief, was, was looking at the, the place of atheism in the history of ideas. Um, and I was wondering how you thought Darwin's theory changed what it's like to be an atheist. I think that there were many people for whom, uh, uh, I think like Richard, I remember my, uh, the interview we had uh, for the program, there were many people who in fact um, who started their life as Christians, who were affected by reading Darwin, so that, and that for, for whom it was a sort of road to Damascus um, in reverse. Um, and um, I think that there are a number of people, I don't know how many, and I think that it's very, very hard to do you know, cultural demography on this, but there are, where are a number of people, impossible to count, for whom, in fact, Darwinian theory must have change their minds um, about the notion of intelligent design, about the notion of a disembodied intelligence at the origin of things. Um, but I think I, speaking for myself, and I think I probably represent another very large constituency of people for whom Darwin simply came along, I mean it was a, a massive uh, 
a massively important biological theory, but had no effect at all on my disbelief. I never had any belief at any time in my life. Um, I came from a Jewish family that had no interest in, uh, in, at the most, they had an interest in the cultural history of Judaism, but no religious belief of any sort at all. Um, my father perhaps was the 19th and 20th century. They tried to inject a kind of poetic Darwinism into human affairs and morality. And uh, it, it was a kind of mad Thatcherism. It was sort of the, the weakest to the wall and the strongest shall win. And this is the Darwinian way. And therefore, um, it's, it's, it's right because it is the way of nature, that, that kind of thing. Well, we've thankfully thrown that overboard. M my own view is that if you're going to get any kind of ethical principle from Darwinism, it should almost be with a negative sign. You could almost define the kind of society we don't want to live in as a Darwinian society. So I've always said that I'm a passionate Darwinian when it comes to understanding why we're here, and I'm a passionate anti-Darwinian when it comes to um, the kind of society we ought to be living in and our morality and how we ought to treat each other. Of course, Darwinians can try to understand where our moral and ethical feelings come from. We can ask questions like, why are we so nice? Which is a pretty baffling question in a, to a naive Darwinian. Why do we give money to charity? Why do we give blood? Um, why do we feel this enormous pang of compassion when we see a, a crying child or a, or a, or a starving person? Or, or indeed a, a starving animal of another species or a, 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 a creature in, in pain. Has it made any in, inroads into that? Well, it, 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 it leaves us a bit baffled and, and uh, we, we can understand it, but, it, but it's not a, not a simple thing to understand. But I think the, the greatest inroad that Darwinism or evolution generally ought to have on our moral sense is that it might lead us to, to think we're on our own in the universe and it's up to us to decide how we're going to run